Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our NBU's uh, Open Research Seminar. Today, we are happy to welcome Matthias Meyer from the Mannheim University, who will present the paper Multi Policy Market Dispersion and Aggregate Donald Data Productivity. So, please, Matthias, so the floor is yours. So, yeah, thanks a lot for having me here. Um, it's a great pleasure to present my work. Um, so, this is joint work with Timo Reinen, who's a PhD student in Mannheim. Um, and um, I've recently received a, a fellowship by the ECB, and now they want me to put this fine print on all the on all presentation slides and papers. So um, that's at the bottom. Um, okay. So now the broad motivation for this project is to understand the monetary transmission mechanism. Okay. So this is one of the old classic questions that macroeconomists since since early on have tried to understand. Um, and um, you know, there's one, there's one class of models that have been particularly successful and widely used um, to study these type of questions, the monetary transmission mechanism, quantitative magnitudes, its role, et cetera. And that type of model is the Newcanian model. And the central feature of the Newcanian model, which gives rise to real effects of monetary policy shocks, or of nominal sh shocks, um, are rigid prices. Okay? Now, rigid prices, in turn, um, have been, well, price strategies have been documented in microdata. Okay, so interestingly, this only has started quite recently. Okay, so the new Keynesian models have been around for longer, um, at least since the, since the 90s, or at least since the 80s. But only in the early 2000s, people have managed to get access to the microdata underlying the, um, the producer price index in the US and the consumer price index in the US. And I understand that this is also a bit of an issue here to get access to the microdata underlying. Um, official inflation figures. Um, so, and, and what's the great thing is what, what, once you have access to them, you can actually look at how often prices change. And if you do that, you see that prices change about every four months or every six months. Um, once you look at the microdata, you, could, you will also see that price rigidity, so the frequency at which prices are adjusted, prices at the, at the <laughs> unit level, at the micro level, um, is very heterogeneous across. Okay, so some prices are adjusted almost every day, other prices are adjusted only every two years. Um, and these uh, heterogeneities have been, have, may have important implications for the transmission of monetary policy, um, as has been studied in a couple of papers, for example, Gorok Nishenko and Weber, uh, Cavallo, Pasture and Abebe, emphasis on input-output, a recent working paper by Clayton, Haragal and Sharp, with an emphasis on distribution implications. Um, what we propose in this paper is a novel mechanism through which monetary policy shock, shocks affect the real economy in the presence of um, price, heterogeneous price rigidity. The most important building block of this novel mechanism is what we call an initial condition. The initial condition is that in our workhorse New Keynesian models, you can show and prove that firms which have more rigid prices, which adjust less prices less frequently, will find it optimal to set higher markups. There's a so-called precautionary price setting mechanism in there. Okay, so that's the initial condition, meaning before any shocks happen. Now, when a shock happens, such as a monetary policy shock, which lowers marginal costs, and this will increase markup dispersion. Okay, so there are firms that have higher markups to begin with, before the shock, and those firms are the ones with more rigid prices, so their markups increase even more. While the markups of firms that have lower markups, those firms have less rigid prices, so they adjust their prices by more, their markups increase by less, so the markup dispersion overall increases. Um, markup dispersion in a new Keynesian model is tightly linked to allocative efficiency, meaning how much aggregate output you can produce with the aggregate input uh, factors. Okay, so that, that's what's happening in this, in this model. I mean, the, the main intuition is that if, if firms charge differently large markups, then they use, diff then they use sort of the an ineff inefficient quantities. The firm with a too high markup charge, um, produces too little, and the other one too much, and in the aggregate, you get less output. Um, so an implication of this is lower aggregate total factor productivity and lower GDP. Okay. So that's the mechanism. Um, that's the first part of the... The, the paper to um, discuss and show that this mechanism exists and prove it. Um, and then the second part of the, of the paper is to provide both empirical 
evidence on this mechanism to support this mechanism and to show its and to study its quantitative relevance. Okay, so the, for the empirical evidence, we show that indeed what constitutes the main building block of the mechanism, the initial condition, indeed this is the case in the data sectors that have more rigid prices, meaning their prices are adjusted less frequently, on average have higher markups. So that's good news for us, it supports our, 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 um, our mechanism. Another part, uh, another implication of our mechanism is that contractionary monetary policy shocks raise the dispersion of markups across firms. Again, that's what we find in the data. Um, and finally, um, we show that aggregate TFP responds pretty strongly to monetary policy shocks. So one standard deviation monetary policy shock reduces aggregate TFP by 0.5% after two years, even after taking care of utilization adjustment. Um, finally, we, we, we put our, our mechanism into a um, sort of standard, small scale, if you like, textbook, New Keynesian model, where the only interesting deviation from, from, the, from the textbook model would be, um, is the heterogeneity in price rigidity. Uh, and we show that uh, that model can explain about half of the peak response in market dispersion and half of the peak response in TFP that we find in the data. So that is to say the mechanism is quantitatively relevant as well. Um, now this paper relates to uh, um, at least three strands of literature. So the first literature is the one we've already mentioned two slides earlier, which is the literature on monetary policy in the presence of heterogeneous price rigidity. What this paper brings to the table and contributes, adds to that literature, is the role of proportional price setting, okay, which has been completely overlooked. So again, we are, we are really, the, the model we are proposing is really a very simple model, it's a standard model, which has been studied before, but the mechanism that we show is important and relevant has been completely overlooked. Part of the reason why this mechanism has been overlooked, as I will argue later, is by choice of solution method. Okay, if you solve your standard New Keynesian model, even with heterogeneous price rigidity, by standard first order approximations. So for the aggregate dynamics around the steady state with first order approximation, you miss our mechanism. Um, another literature this, um, this uh, speaks to is a, is a recent, pretty recent literature studying the aggregate productivity response to monetary policy shocks. It's surprising, it was very surprising to us to see how little work has been done on aggregate productivity response to monetary policy. It's surprising because, you know, the one, that there are two paradigms of business cycles in the macro. The real business cycle model in which aggregate productivity fluctuations play the most uh, um, uh, um, um, dramatically important role. And there's the new Keynesian uh, paradigm, uh, which studies monetary policy shocks among other. But the, the link between the, these two literatures is, is, is not very well established. We, we make that link and we, we um, add to this literature, which has mostly focused on R&D as a channel to which monetary policy can affect every productivity. We show that even without R&D, there, there, uh, there are effects through changes in allocative efficiency. Because man misallocation increases after contraction and monetary policy shock, measure every productivity will respond. Finally, there is a, um, by now, pretty large literature that studies the movements of allocative efficiency, the movements of misallocation, the movements of endogenous TFP over the business cycle. Uh, there's a paper by Asfeld and Pini which documents counter-cyclical misallocation, meaning pro-cyclical endogenous TFP. And then there, is a there are a number of papers which, um, have, uh, which are micro-founded models in which misallocation or allocative efficiency endogenously moves over the cycle in response to shocks. Okay, what's missing in that type of literature is um, to provide direct evidence that measures of misallocation, measures of allocative efficiency actually respond to business cycle shocks. So as, as far as we know, we are the first paper to provide such direct evidence. Um, okay, any questions so far? Good, then let me move on. Let me, so in the following, this is the roadmap of the talk, in the following let me first um, explain to you the, the, the mechanism. Um, then I move on to the empirical evidence and then finally come, come up with the New Keynesian model and conclude. So the environment, so in order to, um, to present the mechanism, I want to start from a, a little more general environment than the one I want to introduce later. 
So think of a price setting problem in the presence of adjustment costs. Okay, so there, there is a firm, firm index is, the firm is indexed by I, and the firm needs to set prices from period from today until tomorrow, so a sequence of prices, in order to maximize the net present value <coughs> of um, a profit stream, an expectation. Okay, so beta is a discount factor, PITJ plus PIT plus J is are the firm's prices in period T plus J, PT plus J is an aggregate price index. WT plus J, um, think of that as real marginal costs and period T plus J. Um, could be the real wage, but could be the real marginal cost if you want to think about more factors in production than just labor. And then we have this last block, um, this last part, um, PIT plus J over PT plus J to the power of minus eta to times YT plus J, which is basically demand for um, firm-specific products, which comes out of a CS um, uh, comes out of CS preferences. And finally, there are adjustment costs. So firms need to uh, make these price setting problems in the presence of adjustment costs. And adjustment costs, I mean, you could think of Calvo adjustment costs, where the adjustment cost parameter is infinite with some probability and zero with uh, the complementary probability. It could also be um, Rotenberg adjustment costs, quadratic price adjustment costs. Um, that is not so important as we show, whether it's Calvo or Rotenberg. The key feature of this um, profit maximization problem is that think of the, the static optimal markup. The static optimal markup <coughs> in the presence of the, the demand that is this T eta um, will be eta divided by eta minus one. What this formulation here shows you is, or what this implies, is that whenever markups implied by the, the firm specific price and the firm specific uh, and the gen, um, aggregate uh, real marginal cost. Whenever markups are above static optimal markups, whenever markups are too high, profits fall, and whenever markups are below, profits fall. But importantly, when markups are below optimal, when markups are too low, profits fall more quickly mm -hmm. than if they are above. Okay? And this as asymmetry will lead to a precautionary price setting motive, meaning that firms will optimally choose to set a higher markup whenever they are uncertain about future macroeconomic conditions and whenever there are adjustment costs. Okay, so if you take away either of the, those two conditions, there is no reason to set higher prices. Okay, so if you adjust prices every period, you can adjust it uh, without adjustment costs. You can always adjust it, uh, make sure you charge the optimal markup. Um, and whenever there is no uncertainty, you can make sure the markup is, is at optimal. Um, One question. Yeah. If there is uncertainty, Mm -hmm. But there is no adjustment costs. Yeah. So is it still optimal to make markups higher than uh, optimal? No. no. So because if there are no adjustments, you need both. Exactly. Because if there is no uncertainty, then uh, you. Okay. What I mean by no uncertainty is you always know um, aggregate prices, aggregate marginal costs, and aggregate demands today. Okay. If there is also uncertainty about today's condition, and things are different. If we only assume uncertainty about the future, but there are no adjustment costs, then, if, then the price setting problem becomes a static problem with no uncertainty, it's, it's isomorphic. Um, if you're also uncertain about today's condition, then you set, you, you, even in a one period model, you set your price before observing today's realization of aggregate prices, aggregate margin cost, and aggregate demand, there is again a precautionary price setting model. Okay, because Setting the price before observing the state of the macroeconomy is like a friction. Okay. Yes. So this uh, works for whatever type of market structure these companies operate in. That's a good question. Um, so so f I mean, we would uh, love to know how um, far we can generalize our results. Uh, so far, we haven't. Uh, done that. So so far, I, I can I can tell you with, with absolute uh, certainty that um, because we have propositions and proofs for them, that um, things are work exactly as I described them in the setup with monopolistic competition. Mm -hmm. okay. 
because there is a strand of literature now that looks at market structure uh, and monetary policy mm -hmm. and the transmission uh, yeah. as dependent on the market power of certain firms etc yeah. there's all these large firm literature for example right. that uh, says that when you look at aggregate TFP uh, it might matter the, the yeah. TFP the individual firm level yeah. uh, TFP of the first uh, quantile uh, and that drives the rest. So right. this Carvalho, you mentioned him, he has some papers on this, mm -hmm. uh, on this issue. Uh, That's another Carvalho, you, actually, yeah, there are two Carvalhos. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, then it's yeah. a different one. You're talking Cabe, about the Cambridge Carvalho? Exactly, okay, yeah. together, and then Carvalho has yeah. these uh, yeah. superstar firms discussion. Right. No, I mean, these are perfectly um, important questions. Um, we will, I, I think we will not address them in this paper mm -hmm. because uh, Part of, to my taste, part of the beauty is to stick as closely to the standard model as, as possible, but I think these are perfectly relevant questions and uh, that need to be addressed uh, possibly in future work. Um, okay, so now um, the uh, additional assumption we, well, we make the assumption of monopolistic competition, meaning that firms take aggregate prices and demand is given. Okay, so they don't take into account any potential role they have on aggregate prices, or in other words, they are atomistic, they are small. There are many of them. Um, and uh, an assumption we make in order to obtain uh, close form results and to uh, uh, sharp analytical characterizations is to assume a, a, a somewhat general um, joint stochastic process for these macro variables that firms then take into account. Okay, so what the, the, the process that, I, that I'm showing you here is, is basically an IID process. Okay, so prices are pr aggregate prices, aggregate uh, remarginal cost, and aggregate demand is drawn from an IID distribution every period, centered around some, some steady state levels. Um, you can extend that to a unit root process, to a joint unit root process, that the results perfectly go through, or replace that extent. Um, and um, in some sense, if you, if you want to think about a two-period setup, so take capital T equal to two, then this is a general, um, this is as general as it could be. So any first order approximation of the, um, any log linear solution of the aggregate dynamics under the assumption that shocks are Gaussian will, can be um, nested in this formulation, okay? So we, we don't restrict the, uh, the covariance parameters between the aggregate prices, marginal, pre-marginal costs, and aggregate demand to be to be anything. Our results will, de will somewhat depend on those covariances, but I I'll come there. Okay. Um, so the first result is under the assumption that the adjustment costs are calvo in nature. Okay, so we want to think about um, a calvo price adjustment probability or in other words, a um, two-point uh, price adjustment cost distribution where costs are either zero or infinity. So with probability theta i, you do not adjust um, prices in that period. And with the complementarity, complementary probability, you adjust them theta i. So it's indexed by i, so it can be heterogeneous by firms. Um, now the first result is, is exactly on precautionary price setting. So we show that if you start from steady state, if you start from price, aggregate prices and real marginal costs to be at a steady state level, um, then all we need is to assume that this function of variances and covariances, I, I'll explain more about that, is, is larger than zero. And what follows is that firms will find it optimal to set a markup which is higher than the static optimal markup, eta over eta minus one in the setup. And in addition, the markup will further increase in theta i. Okay, so the more rigid prices are, the larger theta i is, the more your um, markup, your reset markup, um, will deviate from static optimal. Okay, so let me comment on that. First of all, we, we um, assume that the economy is at steady state, because otherwise, if, you're, if, if your PT or WT is away from, from, from those um, mean values, then you have an additional motive to change markups okay? because you, you expect to move along some path and we don't want that to, to um, distort our analysis of the pure precautionary price setting effect. The other thing is this, this, covari this formula or the sum of covariances and variances 
We need that to be larger than zero, which I think is a very weak restriction. Because think about what's in there. The first one is sigma square p. I think we all agree that there is uncertainty about inflation. Okay, so at, at least it can't be, it must be strictly, uh, it must be weakly larger than zero. The other terms are covariances. All these covariances, the covariance between price and um, aggregate demand and the covariance between prices and wages or real marginal cost, the sort of a lower bound, a lower empirically plausible bound for all these covariances is zero. Okay, so that, that condition here is easily satisfied by any empirically realistic model. So in that sense, we think this is a pretty general feature of new Keynesian models that firms will find it optimal to set markups above what is statically optimal if there are adjustment frictions and if there is uncertainty. Uh, and at the same time, that, that this, th those markups will further increase the more price, um, the more rigid prices are, the stronger the adjustment frictions are. Okay, so why does that matter? Well, that matters because it has implications for markup dispersions. So first of all, let me define a sort of auxiliary object, which is the pass-through from changes in real marginal costs to prices. Okay, that's the upside on IT. Now what we show in the second proposition is that whenever the correlation between a firm's markup and a firm's um, pass-through is negative, then markup dispersion across firms will, inc will, sorry, will decrease in, in a change in uh, real marginal costs. Okay, so whenever there is a monetary policy shock that lowers marginal costs, markup dispersion across firms will go up. Now, what does this first condition mean, the correlation between markups and, and pass-through? Well, that's basically, I mean, pass a firm with a higher um, cargo parameter more uh, sticky, stickier prices will have also a lower pass-through from, from changes in uh, marginal cost to prices. Okay, so this condition here is directly satisfied if proposition one applies. Okay, so if, so if proposition one applies, then market dispersion decreases in real marginal cost. Yes. I have a question here. So suppose that the monetary shock is in uh, response to labor market conditions or some form of labor market cost? I mean, okay, so when I say, when I say monetary policy shock, I really mean a, a shock in the structural sense, something orthogonal, something unexpected. Okay, so we should not confuse that with... Uh, understood, uh, okay, but, but my question was primarily related to this uh, real marginal cost change. It can come from different sources. In principle, yes. In principle, yes. For this, okay. This proposition here, you can think of that, that's, you can think of that as being completely independent from the first one. Okay? Here we are saying whenever this correlation is negative, for, for whatever reasons, you know, it can, it can be even well, it can be even a model without monetary policy. Um, but for whatever reasons, um, you will mechanically um, obtain that marginal cost, three marginal cost changes will increase or increase decreases will increase market dispersion. Um, now, why do we care about markup dispersion? Okay. Let me explain. So, suppose that we compute final aggregate output, think about GDP, as the CES aggregate of variety goods. That's the standard assumption of the, of, and the, and the engine model. And then, then compute aggregate TFP as a solar residual. In a model where we don't have any capital and we have a constant return to scale production technology, there would be um, you know, firm-specific production technology would be y equal l, and then the aggregate we would use that solar weight being one on labor to compute aggregate TFP as the difference between log aggregate output minus one times log aggregate labor output. Now, if you start from that aggregate TFP formula, and it doesn't have to be exactly that. That's an example. It can be more general, and apply a second-order approximation around markups being equal for all firms and in all time, well, for all firms, that's the important part, equal to the static optimal markup, eta over eta minus one, we obtain that aggregate TFP is approximately minus eta half times markup dispersion. Okay. Plus, of course, if 
the segregate exogenous productivity in there, it will also be captured by the segregate TFP term. But importantly, aggregate TFP measured as a model consistent um, solar residual will capture more than just aggregate exogenous productivity. It will also have a term which captures misallocation of resources across firms, which is what markup dispersion uh, captures. Okay, so the, the, the intuition is that if you take if, if you take one firm with a markup that is higher than the static optimal markup, then from a welfare perspective, that firm produces less output than what would be desired, and vice versa, a firm with a lower markup produces too much output. Okay? So the CS aggregator sort of dictates how much, what, what's the efficient level of output per firm. In the simplest case, with equal taste for each variety good, you should produce an exactly equal quantity of all goods, and the equal quantity of all goods Equal quantity of all variety goods means this is, is the same as saying the markup is the same for all variety goods. In a more complicated, in a more general formulation, um, equal markups do not need to imply um, equal quantities of variety goods. But that's sort of the, the main intu intuition here. Okay, so higher markup dispersion is, 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 is important because it, uh, it implies uh, mark aggregate um, TFP losses. So the, the idea would be that the firm optimizes, finds them, uh, and gets a higher pro higher profit margins at the higher markup, thus produces less. If we combine yeah. it to the firm level. Yeah, and you can see that from basically from now it's hard for me to find somewhere. But uh, to think about the, the second factor in the first term, the P, PI over PT minus eta times Y. Yeah. Okay, so in the presence of when marginal costs are the same for all firms, markups, markup differences are the same as PI, firm level price differences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if firm level prices are different, then, the, then their demand, the, the demand for their, for, their, for their products will be different. And since firms in this class of models always produce what is demanded, they will produce different, different amounts. Yeah. Is this somehow related to, to the bulk to of literature that study trend inflation and their impact on yeah. the productivity? Yeah, I will have something to say at the, about this at the very end. The short answer is, in the model with trend inflation, you also get markup dispersion and therefore aggregate TFP responses, which are of the exact opposite sign of what we find empirically. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so, um, so and, okay, I mean, one class of um, literature this closely relates to our, our TFP formula, uh, relates to is, um, is um, the macro development literature, think about misallocation and under explaining cross country differences in agri TFP, going back to Sheen Klino's paper, but also Marka Ifari recently have a series of work with markup wedges in which they are trying to understand these TF, endogenous TFP differences. So you, you see very similar formulas there, it's not something we, we made up. Um, and, uh, but, and in addition, you also get the, the, a very similar type of, uh, type of mechanism in the textbook uh, New Keynesian model, whether you open your book Woodford or, um, or Gali. Once you aggregate individual firms to a macro level, there is, um, before looking at the steady state, you, you have a term which is price, the price dispersion term, which is captures endogenous aggregate TFP fluctuations uh, when there's, and again, price dispersion here is the same as market dispersion. At least in logs. Okay. Um, now this um, little applied theory part of the paper is um, does not only clarify the mechanism that we have in mind, but it also provides us with a number of testable implications which we do bring to the data. The first one is that industries with more rigid prices have higher markups. Second testable implication. Markup dispersion should increase after monetary policy shocks. I need to be precise here. When I say monetary policy shock, I mean contractionary monetary policy shocks. We will study symmetric results, so that you can think of the flip side uh, correlation, well, not correlation, flip side movements when you have an expansionary one. But whenever I say monetary policy shock, I mean contractionary monetary policy shock. Um, the third implication is that firms that have higher markups before the shock should increase their markups by more. Because through the lens of this model, a source of higher markups before the shock is higher price rigidity, but well, it's the only source in this model. Okay, so higher, the level of markups before the shock should, on average, be informative about the 
price rigidity of the firm. So if indeed firms with higher markups before the shock have, have more rigid prices, then their markups should increase by more. And the fourth one is aggregate of digital fall in response to contraction and monetary policy shocks. Okay, empirical evidence. Um, so, in the, the, con the conceptual approach to estimating markups is borrowed from uh, an econometrica by the Locker and Gotchinsky in 2012, who show that it's a very simple derivation. If you um, solve the cost minimization problem of the firm, forget about profit maximization, just look at the cost minimization problem, and you assume that there is at least one flexible factor, let's call that X, whatever that is, Flexible meaning there are no adjustment frictions for that factor. Then you can show that the firm specific markup, or the aggregate markup for that matter, it doesn't matter this level of aggregation, the markup can be estimated as the ratio of the output elasticity of that flexible factor X, so the elasticity of output with respect changes in that X factor, divided by the revenue share of that same factor X. And that's what we will use in order to estimate markups at the industry and at the firm level. At the industry level, we use the so-called NBR CES manufacturing database, so US industry level data. I put S in parentheses because S will be my sub-index um, for industries or sectors. Um, and the way we compute, so here we make the assumption that the flexible factor is labor. You can criticize that assumption because we know of labor adjustment frictions. Um, it's, it's an assumption that the Locker and Wachinski make, um, which again does not justify it, it because there is a, lot, a large literature studying uh, search frictions or lab, labor adjustment frictions and so on. Um, my best defense of that assumption is that other, another factor, the capital is clearly uh, more expensive to adjust. There is a good, good amount of evidence if you estimate models with both labor and capital adjustment frictions, you always find that capital is more costly to adjust. And uh, the second line of defense is the best we can do. Okay. So it's the best we can do to estimate markups, uh, I should say. So, can I ask you one thing? Um, supposing that we had firm level um, data on material costs. I'm um, coming there. Hmm? I'm coming to the firm level markups. Maybe, maybe let, let, let's, okay. So the, if, if we assume that the flexible factor is X, then we can compute uh, the output elasticity and revenue shares from that NBRCS manufacturing database, where the only like, thing we need to add to that database is the user cost of capital. It's not included in there. So what we do is we take, um, as a risk-free rate, we take um, um, one-year government bond rates. Uh, we add the uh, Gikris Sakrashek um, credit spread for firms. And we add sector-specific depreciation uh, rates. Okay, so that's why the user cost of capital would be sector-specific. Um, but other than that, that's it. At the firm level, we compute quarterly markups using composite balance sheet data. And um, quarterly is important. Here we want to estimate responses to shocks. So if we use annual data, um, that won't help because this, our sample of shocks, as I will show you, is, is relatively short. Um, and we assume here that the, we make two assumptions. The first one is we assume that the output elasticity is the same for all firms within an industry. Okay. So we assume there's some common technology. Um, they use the same amount of capital in production. Um, and, um, well, no, they don't need to use the same amount of capital, but they, the underlying technology is the same. And then for the revenue share, we assume the flexible factor of adjustment is a composite factor of labor and materials, and that's what's captured by costs of goods sold. Why do we do that? Again, it's the best we can do. That's, we don't observe the payroll, we don't observe material expenses at, quarter, at the quarterly level in Compistat. Um, this composite is the best we can use, and that's also what the Docker ECOUT in, in a recent paper do. Now I, uh, um, I was one, w wondering whether that already yeah, yeah. clarifies your questions. Okay. All right, so that's how we measure those two things. So we will have two types of um, markups. We will work with industry level markups and uh, firm level markups. Um, and finally, we need uh, data on price rigidity. So um, we are very grateful to um, uh, Michael Weber, who shared with us his uh, data. So the microdata um, 
so he has access to uh, the microdata we had to produce our price index in the US. Uh, you can get access to that if you're a US citizen or a resident in the US, which neither my co-author nor I am. Um, so we're grateful to have that data, which is basically the price adjust the, the the data we got is the average frequency of price adjustment um, at the sector level. Okay, so for four up to five digit sectors, we, we know how often on average prices in that sector are adjusted for year or month. Okay, now let's come, let's use those. Let's use the price adjustment frequency uh, from the PPI microdata together with the our sector level markups in order to address the first testable implications of our, of, our, of our mechanism, which is that industries with more rigid prices should have higher markups. In the data, that's exactly what we see. We see that industries in which prices are adjusted more frequently, meaning they have less rigid prices, charge higher markups. And, we, um, and that's significant, statistically significant. Um, and it doesn't make a big difference whether we compute our markups. Um, so those, um, um, the, the payroll term basically here, whether we, whether we include administrative workers or only production. Administrative workers and production workers or only production workers. Um, okay, so the first, so for the first test of implication we have a check. In the, in the data it, it indeed seems to be a case that firms with higher markups um, charge, um, um, have more rigid prices. And in some sense, that is enough for Proposition 2. Okay? So forget about all the rest and all the, all the other part of the, of the mechanism. That is enough for Proposition 2 to, to apply. So that's enough to, for, the, uh, for a response of markup dispersion to, um, at least markup dispersion across sectors, to um, changes in real marginal costs. But I want to go. I want to go deeper than that. I also want to tell t tell you, you know, why. Uh, I also want to provide evidence that speaks to more directly to, to our specific mechanism in its full form. So what we do in, on on top of that cross industry regression is to identify the dynamic effects of various objects to monetary policy shocks. So what we do is we construct monetary policy shocks as the high frequency changes in the three months ahead federal fund future prices in tight time windows around FOMC announcements. Okay, so this goes back to a early paper by Kuttner and has recently become increasingly popular as a, as a sort of the gold standard of um, identifying monetary policy shocks in the US. Um, and you know, we don't do any, anything crazy here, we just borrow from that, from that literature. And what, what this gives us is, is a time series of, of shocks from 95 to 2018 quarter three. Uh, so we had to, we actually bought the tick data behind and uh, data we bought only spans into 2018 quarter three. So we used, that, and then we used that series of shocks to, to study, uh, to estimate the dynamic responses to them. So what we do is we estimate local projections where y, t is some variable of interest so what we, what we do is we regress the difference of y at some period, at h periods in the future relative to period t minus 1, so the period before the shock, and we regress that on the shock. Okay? So the beta h, that's our estimate of the impulse response function to a monetary policy shock at horizon h, um, where we, where we you know, vary h from 0, so the contemporaneous response, to 16. T is here at quarterly frequency. So now one thing we need to do is, um, so we have these monetary policy shocks at daily frequency. Okay? And uh, in almost all the quarters, we have more than one shock happening. Okay? So we need to aggregate those shocks up. Now the standard approach to aggregating these shocks is to sort of take a weighted mean. So you know, if a shock happens at the end of one quarter, you, fu you almost fully um, um, attribute it to the next quarter because firms don't have much time to respond to, to a shock happening at the last day. While the shock that happens on the first day gets fully attributed to that quarter and anything happening in between gets partially attributed to current and next quarter. Therefore, you obtain sort of a, an, an autocorrelation in the, uh, in the 
uh, and, and the quarterly monetary policy shock series. And that's why we add the uh, one leg of the monetary policy shock series and, and the regression. And we also add uh, differences lagged one period in order to account for, to not capture coincidental correlation with pre short trends. Okay, so beta H, however, in, in the following I will always show you the beta H. Okay, so the beta H for different H, those are the impulse response functions, two shocks. Um, and that's when Y is the markup dispersion. Okay, so we, what we've done is we've taken our, we've used our composite data, we've computed markups for each industry, for each firm. We look at the within industry markup dispersion in order to cancel out things that are possibly related to technology and other firm industry specific characteristics that may or may, or may not respond much to monetary policy shocks and compute the dispersion within industries, either four digit or two digit industries, and then show or estimate the response of these dispersion measures to monetary policy shocks. Again, contraction and monetary policy shocks. What you can see is a significant increase in markup dispersion to monetary policy shocks. Okay, so you, you see the peak, the response peaking after about five quarters. Okay, so initially the, the, the effect is small, it builds up, it builds up slowly and then peaks and stays, it's, it's relatively persistent. Okay, also notice that this is uh, statistically significant. The magnitudes at this stage are very hard to interpret. Okay, the magnitudes are, what we have in the Y scale is literally variances of log markups. But I will translate those magnitudes into something meaningful in three slides. So wait for this. So I, I have a question. Well, let's say when this happens the first time, yeah. this makes perfect sense. The, the, the firms, you know, they understand the issue and they adjust. I'm just wondering, doesn't then the firm adjust its own uh, production function to some degree in order to uh, not be surprised on the next step? To, to not be surprised by monetary policy shocks, you mean? Yeah, I mean, you know, better said, this markup dispersion is something that to some, the firm has relatively, if we assume all the monopolistic stuff, the firm has a relatively large uh, control over. Mm -hmm. So once you've been surprised, this is something that you might want to s plan against. No, wait, um, this is the markup dispersion and the cross section of firms. So an individual firm has no control over markup dispersion. Understood, mm -hmm. but in the aggregate, that same firm next period, yeah. uh, or whatever firm survives, unless, of course, you know, there's a huge turnover within the industry and everybody has to learn the lesson again, if they would be seeing this, so my, my, my question is more related, isn't there like a learning mechanism that allows the firm to adjust to these type of things? Because at the end of the day, what, uh, what the message is, <laughs> is that every quarter in a certain, to a certain sense, mm -hmm. um, when, if there is a shock every quarter. Uh, every quarter the firm is surprised to find out that there is this contractual uh, contractual shock and then they increase markups, some more, some less. Mm -hmm. As if the quarter before, when they were planning, mm -hmm. when that happened, that lesson doesn't carry over. Right? Because you mentioned this is, this is a dynamic estimation. So, you know, there's many things that move, so maybe we can discuss this afterwards, but you see my point is that the firm dynamically learns how to mm -hmm. allocate and how to optimize costs. Right. It might be surprised, it might be a, let's say, a shock to the firm in the first, let's say, one, two rounds, yeah. even in the cross-section, assuming the firm is right. there, why does it stay like that and why doesn't the firm adjust afterwards? Because, you know, the point is, you made, you made a good point before, you said, look, this is precautionary price adjustment. Mm -hmm. So I get a shock now if I'm a company mm -hmm. and I'm this uh, uh, in an industry where I know I cannot adjust prices, mm -hmm. what I do, I'm going to increase markups, let's say, by 10%. Right. But the next time I'm getting hit with the same shock of the same magnitude, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not knowing the shock and not knowing the magnitude, this is going to be my, my, you know, my expectation, I'm going to do it maybe, you know, maybe 15 or 20%. Um. So if, I mean shocks happen, I, I'm not sure you can, you can, I mean I think your, your, your question is whether you can 
and <coughs> ensure against having to change your markup or ensure yes. against markup changes by and setting a higher markup? Adjust the production, either adjust the production or the pricing strategy. But you see, I mean, at, at least, I mean, the simplest way to think about this is the Calvo setup. And in the Calvo setup, um, there are firms that are adjusting and there are firms that don't adjust. The firms that don't adjust, you know, there is nothing they do. So markup dis and markup dispersion does increase, at least uh, that view, because some firms don't adjust yeah. and others adjust. And the, the, the adjusters are symmet I mean, are systematically sorted into higher, um, so lower ex ante markups. So in that sense, there is, in that view, there is little um, households can do. Um, actually, I had another slide. I think I, I lost that uh, on uh, Rotenberg. So because the same results also go through with Rotenberg or the adjustment goals. Or better said, if we don't, if we let aside for the for one moment mm -hmm. the theoretical lens, and we were just to look at the empirical data, mm -hmm. it would be interesting to understand uh, how these firms that receive these shocks mm -hmm. behave uh, over repeated sequences. Mm -hmm. Because that tells us whether this assumption, because this, this might be a pretty important assumption on how the firm, the firms don't just pick a number out of the box like mm -hmm. in Calvo sense. There is no ferry also like in the firm setting, like in the labor market. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these capitalists are really cold-blooded uh, mm -hmm. programmers in a sense. They know exactly what they want and what they need. They know the mm -hmm. market structure. They know that if they increase by 1%, the price may be, demand runs the competition. Mm -hmm. And the margin of adjustments might be on the labor and the material side, like uh, mm -hmm. you showed before, but uh, might be to some degree also on, on the price side. So it's not that they randomly do this thing in a sense. No, sure, I mean. Uh, and it would be empirically interesting to understand the, how far or maybe not, uh, how do we relate to this uh, assumption of. Uh, because that's, a, in a sense, it's an essential element here. Uh, I mean, the. Um, in the Rotenberg uh, case, the um, firms adjust prices every period, but subject to quadratic adjustment costs, which are scaled by a different parameter for different types of firms. And their intuition is a bit dif different, but uh, it allows us to get away with the maybe strong assumption that firms adjust only every, every other period, which to some extent I don't find ex ex incredibly strong because firms, I mean, there's some evidence that firms don't. Have, have sort of regular meetings uh, in which they make major decisions such as over prices that may be a little bit industry specific for people. Um, now in the, Calvo, in the Rotenberg um, scenario, the intuition is a bit different. The intuition is that you want to set a higher price in order to avoid large price changes further down the road mm -hmm. if you get into that region where profits are quickly decre decreasing. With the, risk, with the risk of losing market share. Right. And this is not data, right? So that's why I was saying that... Well, it's in the model that you, you, you lose market share if you set a higher markup for precautionary reason. I mean, in some sense, you can tweak the model and sh uh, introduce a demand shifter which sort of can compensate, compensate for that. Yeah. That doesn't change the, the... But it doesn't change the response of the model to shocks. Because, you know, in that model, even in, also in the Rotenberg model, if these firms with higher adjustment costs, mm -hmm. they will optimally set higher markups before. And at the same time, since they have higher adjustment costs, respond by less to shocks. Mm -hmm. So that intuition st still goes through, even if you go, go radically uh, ab abolish the, the Calvo framework and go to the Rotenberg one, it still goes through and it still has a, has a, has a strong implication for markup dispersion. Okay. Um, yeah. um, all right, okay, so second testable implication check. Third testable implication um, was that the Firms with higher markups before the shock may have higher markups because they have, um, on average at least, have uh, stickier prices, higher price adjustment costs. And if that's the case, then their markups should increase by relatively more after contraction and monetary policy shock. So in order to address that hypothesis, we estimate a panel local projection. So it's a bit, the model is a bit different, but it, and it's different in the sense that <coughs> we estimate here the, the interaction effect of the shock with the markup before the shock. So the Z, ZIT minus one is a vector of control variables, which among other things includes, includes the markup before the shock. Okay. And uh, what, what, what you plot in here is the interaction, the, the, the coefficient on the interaction term of the shock with that pre-shock markup. And we see that um, that coefficient is significant positive 
meaning that films with a higher markup before the shock increase their markup by more after the shock. Um, contraction and monetary policy shock. So epsilon T, MP, larger than zero. Okay, finally, um, aggregate, uh, this has implications for aggregate TFP. Um, if there is such a channel operating through market dispersion, and if market dispersion actually means misallocation of resources across firms, then we should observe that aggregate TFP responds to monetary policy shocks. And what I'm showing you here is aggregate TFP following um, Fernald's TFP series, but also the, the green line is the utilization adjusted TFP, so you, you may be worried that um, the main response of aggregate TFP is because firms change how intensively they use their factors of production. Even if you make that take that utilization adjusted TFP, there is, there is still a 0.5% drop in aggregate TFP after the contraction and monetary policy shock, and GDP falls by even more. Um, so that's the last check. Now, I, I promised you that I want to, I, I will translate the markup dispersion response into something economically meaningful. Remember, so I have to go back. Remember, we had this, that, that, that scale here from 0 0.002, which uh, is hard to interpret economically. It does actually get economic meaning once you apply that little formula I showed you earlier. Okay, the, form, the formula that links aggregate TFP to cross sectional um, markup dispersion. We take differences on both sides. And uh, we, we obtain, once we make an assumption about ADA, the elasticity of substitution or the steady state markup, we can obtain the, the response, the, the TFP responses that are implied by the market dispersion responses. Okay, and that's what we, that's the, the blue line here, under ADA equals six. And, and the green line for comparison is the utilization adjusted TFP response, the empirical one. And as you can see, the two lines um, match pretty well. Okay, so. Um, the markup dispersion response appears to be tightly linked to the um, aggregate TFP response. There is some debate in literature about the uh, right value of ADA. It ranges from 3 to 21. Okay, so <laughs> take 21 and we over explain by 1000% or 500%. Take 3, we only explain half of it. Um, yeah, I guess it's, 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 it's I mean, what, what this is meant to show you is that. To, uh, we, we get the, the, the magnitudes roughly right. Okay, any questions so far? I have one little question on the, on the cross-sectional invariance that you showed before. So, all the shocks that you worked with were contractionary? No. No. Contractionary and expansionary. Oh. It's just to fix the sign. Oh. Okay. Because the... Because this model here that we've estimated is a, is a linear model. So we assume the same effects for the negative and positive shocks if they have the same magnitude. Just reverse, reverting the sign of the effect. Because my question is this, we see an increase in the sigma of law, which is clearly difficult to somehow... The, excuse me, say again, the first, the first chart you showed in the cross-section with the increase in variance. Uh -huh. So why is some form of dispersion of the markup correct? Yeah, it's the, the cross-sectional variance of log markups within industries. Okay. Because that makes me somehow believe that if you're hit with a contractionary shock, you wouldn't necessarily expect firms to increase markups, thus increase somehow have an effect on like it would be counterintuitive in a sense. Or do I do, do I don't No, no, this it's, a, it's, a, it's it's the standard Newcanian um, transmission mechanism. So the textbook Newcanian model and most uh, extensions of it. Um, operate on the, on, on the mechanism that um, contraction and monetary policy shocks lower um, real marginal costs, mm -hmm. uh, mainly through uh, labor supply decisions, oh. and uh, to the extent that some firms don't adjust their price, the markup will increase. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so these results are robust in various dimensions. Um, we've chosen to take the three month ahead federal fund future prices as a way to construct monetary policy shocks. This is sort of one of the standard future prices, but you can take different future prices and the results go through. Um, there is by now <coughs> an active debate about what these future prices um, contain. Do they contain something we want to call monetary policy shocks? Or do they also contain something we may want to call news component? Okay, so the idea is, if the central bank surprisingly increases the interest rate, that 
increase is also accompanied by some communication. Okay, so the central bank may, for example, say that they revised upwards their expectations about future growth. Okay? And in some cases, this may surprise agents because investors, let's say, because investors may have had more pessimistic expectations about the state of the economy. So if the increase in the interest rate is accompanied by upward revisions of the expectations about the state of the economy, then this increase in the interest rate can be expansionary. Okay, because it's the news component that is potentially dominating. And this is sort of an, a tricky question because uh, we, our, our theory is based on the presumption that we have a sort of a, a standard monetary policy shock and not that news component in there. So there, there are some ways to, to adjust for that news component, such as regressing the monetary policy shocks, the, the difference in the federal fund future prices on the internal forecasts of the Fed. Okay, we see that our results will go through. Another one is um, to this car, so with around, in, in some of these 30 minute windows, you don't only see interest rates go up, but in the same 30 minute window, you may see that the, the stock price increases and not decreases. Okay, standard theory would predict the stock price should decrease when the interest rates go up, but not necessarily if there's an important news component. Okay, so then what we do, and this is based on work by Yaluchinsky and Karadi from BCB, we discard those shocks in which the uh, stock price goes in sort of counterintuitive um, in, into a, a direction that speaks to the news component. And then finally, we also discuss a bit about the role of unconventional monetary policy shocks, arguing that if we, well, if we drop the QE events, uh, we still find the same, um, same results. Um, the complex data is, uh, I mean, there are many, what, if you work with micro data, there are many choices that you can make uh, in terms of the data treatment, which observations to, to consider, which not, which to classify as an, um, implausible. We've, we've taken a relatively conservative stance, keeping lots of observations in there, but we show robustness if we uh, use alternative treatments. There's also something about delisting. The number of compostite firms, the number of public firms in the US has, has gone down quite a bit. Um, we show that uh, the number of firms does not respond to monetary policy shocks. Okay. Um, and finally, we, we have a little a, a, a sh short section on alternative explanations for the TFP decline. So one of the alternative explanations is R&D. We show some, some evidence in support of that mechanism in line with some previous papers. So R&D seems to, uh, appears to decline after contraction of monetary policy shocks being an alternative explanation. However, with R&D it's always tricky to, you know, the mapping between R&D and TFP is, is non-straightforward. What's the time lag? What are the right magnitudes? How, how does one dollar R&D investment translate into TFP? Um, and uh, yeah, we showed for firm level TFP because the alternative, another explanation for why aggregate TFP response is that average firm level TFP response and the evidence is, is uh, not clear at all. Um, the tendency to no response. All right, that's it on the empirical side. Let me finally move on to the new Keynesian model, this paper. So the, the model setup is the following. Um, we consider really a fairly simple, small scale, almost a textbook new Keynesian model with the twist of heterogeneous price rigidity. So the, there is only one sector in this model. The household is a representative one. Um, there are CS preferences, or in other words, um, final goods are, um, are produced from a CS technology out of variety goods. Um, and there is a constantly trans scale technology to produce these variety goods. Um, then, so these are all the assumptions. Well, I should add maybe monopolistic competition, that's also in there. But these are the, the building blocks of the, of the textbook model. Uh, and then we have a Taylor rule, which is also sort of standard. Um, maybe the non-standard thing is to have some persistence in there, but this is becoming standard. So the Taylor rule links uh, interest rates today to uh, inflation and, and the output gap. Um, but it also, uh, we also allow for some persistence in the Taylor rule. So the, the interest rate today is also a function of the interest rate yesterday. And um, to be clear, so the first factor in the parenthesis is the the PT over PT minus one, that's inflation. And the second one, YT tilde in the denominator, that's um, natural output. Okay, so that's the output level that would prevail in the presence of flexible prices. I'll come back to that, so I want to be 
clear here. So we talk about so the, 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 the this first term there is a response captures the responses to deviations in output from natural output. And then the final term is, uh, is a stochastic shock. That's the monetary policy shock. New T is a monetary policy shock that has a variance sigma square nu. Now the um, sort of where the model is different from the textbook model is that we have we uh, model heterogeneity in the color friction. So at this stage, planning to extend it, but at this stage we model this in the simplest way you can think, possibly imagine. We, th we, we assume there are two types of firms. Um, they are an equal number. Okay, so half of all the firms um, are type one, the other half are type two. Type one firms are just always. Okay, theta is equal to um, zero. The other firms adjust only with a one eight quarterly adjustment probability. We do that because on average we get roughly a one, four, uh, one quarter adjustment probability, which is sort of the standard assumption. Having said that, this is that's, that's a part of the new Keynesian model where we need to work a little bit on. Um, yeah. What's the problem with having n types of shorts with different uh, adjustments? Yeah, we could do that. Um, and, um, the model would still solve perfectly quickly. Um, I mean, the question is where do you stop? Do you stop at three? Do you stop at four? Yeah, so what we are planning what with... What is your goal? Sorry? What is your goal of this exercise? What, what no, the, the goal is to um, provide uh, quantitative results. So that's why we, uh, what we are, what we are, what is next on the agenda is to take the data that we actually have, the data on sector level um, press rigidity. Think about this model as a multi-sector model, where sectors only differ in their calvo parameter, and calibrate those calvo parameters to what we actually observe in the data. And then think about, you know. Probably we don't want to have 500 sectors, the number that we have in the data, in the model, because that would not add too much additional information, but we need to think about the number that is sort of sufficient to capture the heterogeneity. Uh, that's something we still need to do. So at this, part, at this stage, it's as simple as you can think. Two types of firms, one adjusts always, the other one adjusts uh, um, infrequently. Um, now the model calibration beyond that uh, calvo heterogeneity is, um, has two targets. The first target is the relative labor response to monetary policy shocks. Um, so I need to go back a little, sorry about that, and show you. And show you the components of, uh, of TFP. So mm -hmm. here, we, here I show you the, the, the input components of every TFP and how they respond to monetary policy shock. The, just focus on the green dotted line. The green dotted line shows you the labor response. Even two years after the shock, the response is insignificant. Uh, forget about the significance. Uh, even the point estimate is small compared to, the, compared to what the TFP component explains. Okay? So we want to understand the, um, we want, in the, in the calibration of this model, we want to get these relative magnitudes, right? We want to get, um, we want to have the model explain, have the model let labor, the labor response, which is the only uh, input factor in this model, explain only half of the GDP response, which does not target or pin down the level response, how much does GDP response, only the relative response we want to get right. Um, and uh, the, um, sort of the, the parameter that speaks most directly to this is the uh, labor supply elasticity. And then the other one is we want to target the federal funds rate response to monetary policy shock. So the response to a one standard deviation monetary policy shock in the federal funds rate is 30 basis point. That's a target to pin down the um, volatility parameter, sigma square nu, of the monetary policy shock, shocks. Um, and then we, we solve this model. When solving this model, one thing is very important. We should not solve the model as a first order approximation around a deterministic steady state. Because A, in the deterministic steady state, there are no markup differences. In the deterministic steady state, both the, the differences in price rigidity don't make any play any role. Okay? Without uncertainty, that's what we started earlier, without uncertainty, all firms would we charge the optimal markup. So sort of the condition for proposition two is not satisfied, the, the correlation between markups and past. 
So it's important to obtain something like a stochastic steady state. Okay? We need to capture um, steady state or yeah, steady state differences in markups across firms. So to do that, we need to solve the model either using global techniques, global solution techniques, or at least use a third order approximation. Third order approximation allows us to capture the asymmetry in the profit function. The second order approximation wouldn't be enough. Okay? We need the, the asymmetry, we need that on the left. We need for, that for lower markups, profits for more quickly than for high markups. Um, so what we eventually apply is, um, is an algorithm by Maya Gorda, um, which uses a third order approximation, an order, okay, it becomes a little funky, but um, a third order, he uses a third order approximation to uh, obtain the stochastic steady state and the first order dynamics around the stochastic steady state. Okay, so the third order approximation is used to project the deterministic steady state and the sto on the stochastic steady state and its first order approximation around it. So when you say stochastic steady state, that means there's like a distribution of potential equilibrium outcomes, or? No, it, uh, okay, so let me be clear with the uh, definition. Uh, I, should, I should define what I mean because it's not, not clear what that means. So the stochastic steady state is the, um, is the steady state if no shock ever appears, so the economy converges to the stochastic steady state. If no shock ever appears, all shocks are, are zero, but firms take into account uncertainty. Okay, in a deterministic steady state, firms know there's no uncertainty, and then no shocks appear, and then you converge there. Okay? So the stochastic steady state takes uncertainty into account, which is important to give rise to precautionary precedent motive. In this stochastic steady state, quantitatively, we find that the sticky price firms charge a 5% higher markup. Okay, and the, the baseline markup, the, the markup we start from, we, we assume eta equal 6, which implies a 20% markup. Okay, so it's relatively, in relative terms, these are large differences. And these are the response to a one standard deviation monetary policy shock. So the blue lines show you the responses of our baseline model. Okay, so that's the, that's the model we developed. The green line, in contrast, shows you the responses to a model that is calibrated to the, um, that has the same, that is described by the same parameters. Um, no, that is calibrated not to match the relative labor response because in that model there is no aggregate endogenous TRP response, but it's only recalibrated to match the, um, match the interest rate response, the normal rate response but that completely shuts off heterogeneity and price rigidity. Okay, so there's only one type of firm. They have a calvo uh, rigidity, which implies uh, one quarter of firms adjust, adjust every quarter. And, um, but again, it's, it's, so the, the, the equality on the nominal rate response, that's a calibration target, nothing else. Okay, now the, as I said, the aggregate TFP response is um, by construction zero without heterogeneity. While we do see a, a relatively large response in aggregate TFP in the model with heterogeneous price stickiness. Okay, so we see a response of almost 0.25% at peak. And in relative terms, this explains about half of the, half of the GDP response. That's a, that's a target, so that's not interesting. Because the, the, the relative magnitudes of aggregate TFP and GDP is the same as the relative response of labor to GDP, so that was a target. What we have in target is the magnitudes. Okay, so we get a almost 0.4% GDP response and um, larger than 0.2 aggregate TFP response. Now the, on the bottom, bottom right panel, you can see that, uh, you, that we, we show that we contrast the markup responses. For flexible price firms, there is no markup response. They always sit on a static optimum markup. The sticky price firms, however, which already have a higher markup in the stochastic steady state, the 5% higher one as I explained earlier, their markup increases further. And then, in contrast, the green line is the markup response of the homogeneous firm on the other type of model. And you know, here you can see the mark where market dispersion is coming from. Firms with higher markups, ex ante, increase their markups by more. Um, okay, so I have a little bit to say about policy implications. I mean, going beyond the, what I've already said. Um, suppose the, the following simple exercise 
Suppose can, that. Can you can you talk a little bit more about markups? What, what, what's going on? Because you said that sticky price firms at least more than flexible price firms. But so the flexible yeah. price firms, they just have period. Yeah, yeah, understand. So their markup doesn't change. But, the, but what's happening here is that um, the contractual amount of policy shock lowers real marginal costs. Okay, so the, if some of the firms don't adjust, so this is the average markup of the sticky price firms, because for the sticky price firms, the class of sticky price firms, some of them adjust, some don't. Okay, so I see so, so you say it's average? Okay. That's so, what I mean. And if you compare it with a firm who actually adjusted, so then it implies that it's much higher than that. Yes. So on average, they, on every sticky price firm, it just markups as a flexible. No, 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 okay, we need to be careful. So the markup increases because they don't adjust prices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. The costs go down and they're happy, they're happy with the additional profit if you wish. It's not profit. It's well, well, in the Calvo setup, they, they, they just are unlucky, they don't yeah, adjust. Yeah. Um, so whatever the cost, they will, um, yeah. But why is it more persistent in the heterogeneous setup? That's what I cannot understand. So the, the green line here means yeah. that all, pri all firms are subject to sticky prices. So there is a paper by, that I cited earlier by Carvalho in 2006, I think Economic Letters, which, um, which addresses exactly that question. Um, what happens to persistence when you replace the one calvo or one stickiness model, one type of stickiness model with a model where you have heterogeneity centered around the same mean stickiness? And uh, he shows that persistence goes up the model is simply not linear in that dimension. Okay. So it's like a, a normal case. And it's yeah, it's not, it's not out of, it's not unnormal. Yeah. All right, uh, so let's go back to the scenario. So the scenario is, so, okay, what I've done, okay, let me be clear about natural output. What I have done to compute these figures is to assume that natural output, the denominator in the, in the, in the Taylor rule, does not, does not change after the monetary policy shock. Because all that's happening here is because of price rigidity. The prices were not rigid, there would be no responsive output. Okay, so natural output shouldn't change if we define it this way. Now the, the exercise that I have in mind is, what if a policymaker observes the change in aggregate TFP and attributes it to an exogenous aggregate uh, TFP shock. Okay. In that case, it's a supply shock. Natural output would respond to a supply shock. It's even with flexible prices, you see a response. So then you get a different formula for natural output. Okay. And that's what I do here. So I assume that, uh, or I, I suppose that Monterey Authority uh, computes natural output um, under a different assumption of, the, under the assumption that the observed responses of TFP are due to exogenous shocks. And what comes out of that model is that the standard deviation of GDP will be substantially higher, will be 10% higher. Okay. So in a sense, the same Taylor rule with exactly the same coefficients, just with a miscalculated or misperceived uh, natural output, will lead to 10% less output stabilization. Yeah, and on the bottom you see the GDP response to monetary policy shock where blue is baseline and red is the response if um, we replace natural output with uh, the misperceived natural output. Okay? So you see the red responses are stronger. Um, now let me come back to, uh, you raised that point with trend inflation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me come back to that. But uh, let me first uh, explain, okay, I, I think I already explained well, first and second order approximation won't do the job, so the standard Keynesian model with homogeneous price rigidity won't work, even with heterogeneous price rigidity. We, um, um, no wait, I, I only explained why with heterogeneous price rigidity you need the higher order approximation or the global solution. With, uh, in, uh, in the case of homogeneous price rigidity, things are even simpler. Markup dispersion is exactly zero at the steady state, be it the deterministic or the stochastic steady state, doesn't make a difference, it's always zero. Um, so in that model, if you take a first order approximation around any 
steady state. There is no change in uh, markup dispersion. Why is that not? Because the markup dispersion is minimized at the steady state. Okay, so if you take a first order approximation around the minimum, you get a zero coefficient. Uh, second order approximation will be non-zero, but then um, in the second order approximation, markup dispersion would increase for any type of shock, whether it's a positive or a negative shock. So you get a counterfactual uh, response of markup dispersion to to uh, to the to the positive shocks, the expansionary shocks. I mean. Now in the new Keynesian model with trend inflation and and homogeneous price rigidity. Um, What's happening is that there are those firms that have a that reset prices and those firms that have reset prices in the past and don't reset now. Okay, so think about Calvo with trend inflation. Now, firms that have adjusted in the past have lower markups. Okay, their markup, markups deteriorate over time along that trend inflation path. Um, so there is markup dispersion in that model, even in the steady state, along that path because firms have adjusted prices at different points in time. Now, when a contractionary monetary policy shock hits the economy, the markup, the, the prices of firms that have adjusted prices in the past doesn't change, but newly reset prices will be lower. Okay? Meaning that the newly reset prices will be closer to the old, the previously reset prices, meaning market dispersion shrinks. And that's exactly, that goes exactly counter to what's happening in our model. So it would be interesting actually to extend our model for trend inflation and to see which the effect dominates. <laughs> yeah. So that's something that's something else on the to-do list. Um, okay, with that, uh, let me now come to my conclusion. So what we've argued in this paper is that heterogeneity in firm level price setting frictions is of first order important to understand the monetary transmission mechanism. We've shown that on average firms with more rigid prices will set higher markups. We've shown that both in the data but also on, on, on theoretical grounds. Um, which then implies that monetary policy shocks will increase the relative markup of firms with more rigid prices, leading to markup dispersion and therefore adverse aggregate TFP responses. Okay, so our contributions broadly um, on that type of mechanism speak to that mechanism. We provide new empirical evidence, we characterize a novel that, that, that novel type of mechanism and studies quantitative relevance in a fairly standard UK engine model. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, any questions?